if if people don't mind, I'm going to record sure. for posterity's sake for the uh, archive. Um, yeah, well, as Rabbi Hammerman, as you were just talking about having climbed Mount Sinai, I was flashing back to my gap year in Israel uh, between high school and college, where for my spring break, four other friends and I went to Egypt right before Pesach. Yeah. And, and we did like a little Yitziat Mitzrayim and it was, it was very nice to visit Egypt and then to leave Egypt to go to Israel in time for Pesach. Um, so it's, uh, it's fun to, to connect lived experience to, to our Jewish lives. Um, everybody, welcome to our joint Tikkun Lel Shavuot. Um, it's, a, it's a joy and a pleasure to be doing this together and to, uh, for all of us to get to spend a little bit of time together and um, after the, the teaching part, before we shift over into the conservative movements tikkun, um, we'll have a chance just to spend a little bit of time talking to each other um, and hopefully the chance to get to know people that we, we don't know or don't know very well yet because um, all of it is Torah and that's what we're celebrating on this holiday of Shavuot. Um, so, uh, you know, thank you to Rabbi Hammerman for the suggestion that we do it together. And thank you also for coming up with the, with the provocative title, Ruth and Roe, Conversation About Choice. Um, and so what we decided to do was that the, the four teachers, um, we've each been thinking of different aspects of the book of Ruth that we're prepared to, to share a little bit um, with our group here. Um, and then and then we'll turn into a conversation and we are an intimate enough group this evening that we really welcome your thoughts on the book of Ruth and any um, impact that you think that that conversation has on the current conversation around Roe, um, which of course is the more provocative part, Ruth less so. Um, so that's sort of the, the sketch of the evening. So, um, so I'll, I'll just offer some thoughts first on this uh, really beautiful book from our Tanakh, from our Bible. Um, and, and the first is just to comment on, on its name, right? How many books of the Tanakh are named for a woman? Ruth and Esther, am I missing something? I'm glancing over at my dad. I think it's Ruth and Esther. Um, and and it's if you include Apocrypha, you've got Judith, but we're not going to go there. And Judith Raphael gives two thumbs up for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but but it's really remarkable that out of twenty four biblical books, there are only two that are that are named for women, um, and that's sort of the the perspective that I'm taking uh, talking about the Book of Ruth is the perspective yeah. of of women, women's Definitely. leadership. And um, I'm going to mute Karen there. Um, for the vast majority of our Tanakh, women are relegated to, to such a small role. Um, and when they do appear, it's very often in the role of becoming mothers, mothering, trying to become a mother, being frustrated at not being able to become a mother this whole theme throughout the book of Genesis of infertility and frustration um, and, then, and then miraculous birth. And you know what? Barely any of that appears in the book of Ruth, right? There's like so much about women and hardly any of it is related to trying to become a mother, um, which is just, it's so remarkable. So I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about both of those, both of those things. Um, the first really is that this is a story about women, okay? Even though the opening line talks about a guy named Elimelech, he got married and had two sons, very quickly, um, that seems to just be a catalyst to get to Naomi, his widow, and Ruth and Orpah, the two widowed daughters-in-law, whereas Elimelech and the two sons, Mahlon and Chilion, um, they die, we don't know why, um, but we're left with this story of Naomi and Ruth after Orpah chooses to go back to her, her family of origin. 
And um, this is a story that is about connectedness. It's about narrative, not so much about law. Um, it's really about um, the relationship between Ruth and Naomi um, and the ways that their relationship eventually enables Ruth to find a new, to find and create a new family for herself. Um, and so to see women's agency in that way, women's centrality in that way is so unique in the Tanakh. So that's one thing. Um, and I, I would say that as that impacts the conversation that, that we're opening about Roe versus Wade and its place in our current society, um, the spotlight on the centrality of a woman's experience I think is really, really important. And I, I just wanna broaden that even to say the spotlight on a non-man's experience is really important because as we know in the current conversation around um, who, who can be pregnant, who might be in need of an abortion um, under whatever circumstances, sometimes there are uh, trans men who are also pregnant and in need of, of such medical care. I just want to make sure to say that out loud. The other aspect uh, related to, to women is this idea that, that Ruth, you know, she's, she's part of Naomi's family. She's not rushing off, maybe like Orpah, we're not even sure what her future will hold for her. Um, she's not, she's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, here's another woman vying for centrality. And one day she's gonna have the corner office, everybody. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all good, all good. Um, so this idea that Ruth, um, after she's widowed, is not rushing off immediately to look for um, a new husband. She's not itching, as far as we know, to become a mother, even though both of those things do eventually happen by the end of the book of Ruth. Um, her focus really seems to be on clinging to this other female in her life, um, nurturing that relationship, even choosing to become Israelite, to become Jewish, because that's what Naomi's life is. Um, that's a huge move for Ruth and, and such a bold statement that she makes um, early on in the book of Ruth. Um, and I when I think about it in through the lens of the Roe conversation, it really makes me remember that um, people become pregnant all the time and they're not always looking to become pregnant. And very often um, people seek out an abortion in order to keep their life on the path that, they, that they're set on. Um, and that having a child at that point in their lives whether because of their age, because of their economic status, because of where they are in their educational path or their professional life. <laughs> it's just not the right time. Um, and it's extremely important that they have that choice to do with their body what they want to do with it and to, um, to chart the course of their life the way that they want it to be. Um, and so, those, those things seem to be really central to me when thinking about Ruth as a book about non-males. Um, and I, this is really hard for me to do while this is happening. It's probably hard for you to focus also. So I apologize about that. Um, I'm gonna <laughs> stop my talking now. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to the next teacher. And um, after the other three have a chance to present, uh, we'll be able to talk more about it. If it's making you think about stuff that you want to share, I think we'll. So let me hand back over to Rabbi Hammerman. Thank you. And you are totally being upstaged, but it is so beautiful. It is so wonderful. And it just highlights one of the, the exceptional things of the intimacy of being on Zoom that, you know, 
we sort of have been trying to give up, but it's a nice reminder of it. And I'm gonna ask Rabbi Ginsburg to go second, um, but I just wanna, I, I sort of alluded to something and it probably was unfair of me not to be more specific because I do believe both congregations have gone through the official channels. We are not merging, so that is not happening, but our Hebrew school programs are coming together in a new partnership um, beginning with the, the upcoming year, which means next month. So um, all of the, our, our board voted on it this past week. I know the Norwalk board the week before, and um, it's a very exciting proposition. And um, I, I know that the rabbis, we have worked together in, on, on many, in many contexts, and we're really looking forward to it. So that's why we thought, one of the reasons we thought that this <laughs> session would be an important thing to do. It, it's a nice way to sort of kick things off. Maybe we'll do some more adult ed together. We've always shared a lot of values. The two congregations have so much in common, most especially the vision of the conservative movement. And, um, you know, it, it's just, a, it's a really nice thing. Plus, when the uh, leaked draft report from the Supreme Court came out, um, it became very clear that we needed to use this opportunity of studying the Book of Ruth um, to tie it into what is going to happen this month without doubt at this point, and that is the end of Roe v. Wade. Um, and, and, and to try to find some meaning in this most feminist of all books of the Bible and most beautiful in many ways of all books of the Bible. So we've started that process here. Um, and uh, you know, just with the, the notion of it being female centric. And since we have a panel where everyone else is a man, that was very much your, yours to do. But I'm gonna ask Rabbi Ginsburg now to talk about another very important aspect of this book. Well, I think at the core, the book of Ruth is a real simple, straightforward story. We're not talking about a lot of different curves and slings and arrows, if you will. We're talking about a very straight story about uh, Ruth and Naomi and Boaz. But the one thing that we get from all of the interaction between Ruth and Naomi at the beginning and then later on with Boaz is that they all, first of all, love each other. And they also show that love, not only to them, but to other members of the community. And this is known as Gimilu Chasadim, um, acts of loving kindness. And the question would be, if you would think that an abortion would be an act of loving kindness, which I think in many, many circumstances it would be. But I'm not going to dwell on, on that angle. I'm drawing more on um, the kindness uh, of, of everybody. Um, and it, it affects not only them, it affects the entire community. And <clears throat> Boaz takes Ruth as his wife and redeems the land. Um, it, we set a wonderful story in place. We set a story where everybody um, really loves each other, reaches out towards each other. And I think that's the central theme. I mean, a lot of people have questioned over the years, why is the book of Ruth in, in the Tanakh? Uh, it's one of the scrolls, but why is it there? And many people point to the fact that it is this teaching of giving Lut Chasadim, of acts of loving kindness, which is the reason which the Ruth is, is in there. So as we read that, we have to look for that at every turn um, between Naomi and her two daughters-in-law um, and her future husband and within the town and the townspeople. And I think that you will find that that is really the central theme in the book of Ruth. And it's a wonderful story. And we don't have to take it much further than it, than it is, because it is talking about the central theme of Judaism, really, love. So you're muted. 
All right. Um, any anything else? Do you want to add anything else? I'm sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. No. Okay. So maybe I'll pick it up from there because I think what we have is, you know, a a combination of of two very important elements: um, the centrality of women and the centrality of chesed. Chesed is certainly a word that is repeated again and again, and and the acts of chesed are repeated again and again. And I know that um, Rabbi Ginsburg and I, when we were talking about it, the notion of conversion, of course, Ruth is the first Jew by choice, at least in, in the traditional sense, um, except that her conversion was done out of chesed, was done because she showed love. She said, where you go, I will go. Your God is my God. Um, conversion's gotten a lot more complicated and political since then. But so you have this, you have the notion of, of the centrality of women, the centrality of chesed and love. And I want to add one more element to it, and that is life. Because after all, what we're talking about is being pro-life. And I believe from a Jewish perspective, of course, there are always many Jewish perspectives, but there's astounding consensus around the notion that we are a pro-life people but life does not begin at conception. Life in terms of the birth of a child begins much, much later, really to be simplest about it, with the birth of a child and not with conception. So abortion is not murder. I mean, all of that needs to be said because we're talking about Roe v. Wade. But the focus of this book is about the triumph of life over death. And the triumph of life over death is achieved in some ways through the birth of a child, but the child is not the central element of that achievement. In fact, you, you can say that the birth of Ruth's child, which is later in the book, and we're giving away the punchline, spoiler alert, becomes down the road, King David's line, and that means the messianic line, and the whole purpose of messianism, the messiah in Jewish tradition, is to defeat death, ultimately to defeat death. So the ultimate triumph of life is expressed in this book, but the means for that triumph are chesed. Love is the root. We read that in Song of Songs already, and the, the co connection between Passover and Shavuot is, is very profound. Song of Songs, we say love is as strong as death, and here on Shavuot, we concretize that. We, we make it into a covenant, a covenant that life comes from love. Um, that life is a product of chesed, is a product of love. Um, and that, that comes, when that comes, death is defeated. Um, Yitz Greenberg, of course, the, the great uh, contemporary rabbi, a teacher of mine, a teacher of so many, and also someone who focuses on the Holocaust in many ways and about post-Holocaust theology, he says that only after the Holocaust can one understand the true meaning of this book because despite its gentleness its pastoral nature book of ruth is filled with tragedy and suffering and betrayal and famine it starts with famine and death and abandonment and uh, people wandering and suddenly these two men die suddenly and and these women are left without children on foreign soil and they're like holocaust survivors it's very easy to ask, what is the meaning of all this? So the book is born in a life versus death struggle. And it's through love, it's through kindness that life triumphs. And let's see if I can show something here. Uh, okay, so um, we see it, you know, right at the beginning of the book. When the, the two men die, Naomi says to her two, her two daughters in law, turn back, each of you, go away. You know, really, leave me alone. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you, as you have dealt with the dead and me. There's a, there's a key term here, chesed, having to do with death. And in fact, this is one of the origin statements of the act of chesed shalemet. What did Ruth do? Ruth allowed for the proper burial of the two sons of Naomi who died. Um, and that is chesed shalemet is what a Hebra Kadisha does in our day. So we have the act of love being the triumph over death, being the victory of life over death, even in a context 
of death. You see it even in the names, by the way, the names of the people of this book. It's clearly this, this cosmic life versus death struggle. So we go from Naomi, who has a pleasant name, it means pleasant, um, but who's also called Mara. I must admit, I know some very wonderful Maras, but here it means bitter. And she, she goes from bitter to Mara. The name of the son, uh, Machlon, his name is Siki. <laughs> I mean, basically, it's all about sickness. And yet, we're able to transport from that world of death to a world of life and love um, through the agency of Ruth, whose name um, often is interpreted as coming from the word reyut, which means friendship. So it, it's chesed, it's friendship, it's all of that that brings them together um, and uh, allows for the triumph of life. Now, what about the kids? Okay, so is it through, and I just want to sort of, it's a Roe v. Wade question. Is it through the birth of children that life triumphs over death? I think this book says no, and I sort of alluded to that. Yes, we're going to have a line that leads to David and to the Messiah. But in fact, Naomi is making it clear even from the start that it's, you know, you shouldn't wait to have children to find fulfillment, to find healing, to find hope. And he, she's telling her daughters, you know, I mean, her daughters-in-law, you know, to leave because it's going to take her a long time to have more kids and for one to grow up, for them to marry under the old custom of marrying the, the brother of uh, someone who's passed away to keep on the family line going. And so it's, it's not about children. It's about the loyalty of Ruth because she still stays with Naomi, even though Naomi's, the, the path to having progeny is hopeless. The choice that Ruth makes is still to remain with Naomi through this love. And Naomi and Ruth's love um, is very profound. The word Ahava is used in terms of their relationship. So fertility in itself is not the key to the renewal of life. Otherwise, Ruth would have gone home, found a nice Moabite guy, and um, that's it. But Ruth and, and Naomi encouraged her to do that, but Ruth didn't do that. Now, the other verse I just wanted, we're, we're trying to do just a few quick points. So at the end, Ruth, chapter four, um, Boaz, Ruth, they have a kid. And you would think the focus would be on this child, once again, this child that will be the source of salvation for future generations yet to be born. I mean, we still haven't seen it. The mess messianic line has yet to be fulfilled. But this child, although in some way a, a, an agent of redemption, is not the agent of redemption. Um, Naomi's and Ruth's love is the agent of redemption. And God is also as well. Um, the key, the, but, but the... Um, the child is not the product of God's love for Ruth or Boaz's love for Ruth, but of Ruth's love for Naomi. Love is still only mentioned in the context of that relationship. And the child is the extension of that original act of chesed, of the burial of Naomi's sons. And some believe that this child is sort of not a replacement in the book of Job sense, but in many ways, the reestablishment of life in the face of the death of Machlon and Chilion, um, the sons of Naomi. It's the response to death as a life-affirming act. Having the child, in this case, is a life-affirming act. And it's the life-affirming act that matters more than the question of um, the pregnancy being the key to salvation. So I want to conclude with uh, Aviva Zornberg, great Torah um, commentator, modern one. And she wrote about this, that, um, that the, the idea of spreading life, the movement outward of life and goodness is what is most important, this most important act of chesed. I give because I want life to be more, because I want more life, because I want what may not be sufficiently alive to be more alive, or I want what may be already sufficiently alive to be more alive, because I have an abundance because I have plenty within me, because I want to give out to the world, regardless of the particular need at the particular 
moment. So it is the triumph of life, not the triumph of subjugating women. That is the key to the book of Ruth. So I know that's a lot to swallow, but um, David, would you like to uh, make some comments or share sure. some reactions? Sure. So I, I, in the email exchange leading up to this, I offered as the one non-rabbi to be the gadfly or the fly in the ointment, which is uh, my standard role. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to be as consistent as I can be. And I just wanted to, uh, Rabbi Hammerman, if you went back to that last text clip from chapter four of uh, Megillat Ruth, what's fascinating to me and, and, and the context that I'm coming from is as follows. Right before, in the, in the verses that precede this wonderful conclusion, we go through um, basically a property transaction. And so this is where um, it's less women agent oriented. This is where we refer to some old customs and old practices uh, where property was transferred by men to other men uh, without any consent of any women. And uh, it includes ultimately the women themselves. Um, so we, 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 we have to acknowledge that in the context of thinking about the Book of Ruth and thinking about choice and freedoms of choice, um, while Ruth chose to stay with Naomi and Ruth in chapter two chooses uh, in chapter three to, 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 to do these beautiful acts of loving kindness to help feed her mother-in-law, and, and to restore some, some, some value uh, in, into Naomi's well-being physically and emotionally and spiritually. And ultimately, uh, the, the, the book suggests that she's very willing and interested and does everything she possibly can uh, to, to, to come together with Boaz. The reality is, is it's not consummated until a business transaction is completed. And one of the things that I'm thinking about these days is that in the larger Jewish community, while um, both modern or liberal Orthodox, however you want to look at it, and traditional Orthodox Jews have come out very strongly against this uh, draft opinion, such as it is, um, and very much want preservation of religious freedom and very much want the right for um, religious Jewish women indeed to have the opportunity if it's warranted under certain conditions to have abortions much later than certainly some of the terms uh, in, in states that have come out with legislation, it's still under conditions. And within our large tent of American Jewry, we have to be cognizant of those who keep to tradition. Um, we want them in the same tent. We want to converse with them. So we want to choose and exercise our right and our, our hope to, to keep this conversation going with people with whom we sometimes don't see eye to eye very well religiously, um, maybe even politically. But in this case, we actually have an opportunity to work together um, largely on the same goals. Um, and so to me, I think one of, the, one of the hopes that I have in terms of choice as it relates particularly to Roe in the current political context, but more so really as it references the book of Ruth is the following. We do have this exchange, this, this transaction, this business transaction, but immediately after, as, as we have in this text, the celebration of that transaction leads to blessing. And, and, and the crowd that's gathered um, conveys blessing uh, to Boaz, to Naomi, to Ruth for what is accomplished and what they hope will be accomplished, which ultimately is this child um, who leads to the messianic line. And to me, one of the interesting contrasts between the book of Esther and the book of Ruth is that in the book of Esther, there's no mention of God at all. In the book of Ruth, God is mentioned regularly, but God is not a central actor. God is not a change agent unless you read in between the lines at the beginning, but that's, that's a separate conversation. God is invoked by people, by regular people, 
And so they are choosing to bring God into the conversation. And so I hope um, in the coming days, in the coming weeks, however long it takes for the opinion to come out, whatever the reverberations are, that we, all of us, choose uh, to, uh, to be respectful um, and invoke blessing when we can, because sometimes the text itself is not as pleasant as we like it to be. Yeah, it is, it is interesting. I've seen that contrast. I think actually Aviva Zornberg talks about the Esther-Ruth contrast, um, that God, um, God follows the human lead. God doesn't do a nice thing until the human beings have done incredible nice things. This act of kindness of having a baby bearing a son. And even there, Ruth goes one up by being a surrogate mom and giving that child to her mother-in-law, right. to Naomi. And so in the end, what is a, you know, an, an act of great kindness by God of this, this creation of, of, of a life of a human being as it was born, um, still is overshadowed by the love, the kindness that Ruth shows in giving and in, in completing that that circle of healing from Naomi's grief and her passivity at the beginning of the book to what we see at the end, where she becomes um, the the nursing mother once again. Would anyone else like to share any thoughts, ideas? They can relate to what we've been talking about or not. Me. Well, yes, Sandy. Fascinating discussion. Um, I see the Book of Ruth as a transition story. It starts out with Naomi allowing the daughter-in-laws to leave. And I think that the love aspect that everyone has basically spoken so eloquently about with Ruth, I also see the flip side of the coin, which is loyalty that you mentioned, that she's loyal. She loves Naomi, but it's her loyalty that allows her to make the decision to go with Naomi. On Naomi's part, she loves Ruth, but it's her acceptance of the loyalty that permits her to take Ruth under her wing and for them to move forward. So I think that when you take a look at the concept of love, there are so many factors that go into love when you were mentioning before that children are born out of love. Part of the issue with Roe versus Wade, as so many have brought up, is that there are instances whereby violence basically breeds to a pregnancy. And because there is no love but violence, people should have the choice, or a woman should have the choice whether to carry that pregnancy to fruition or to undergo an abortion. So I think that all of these concepts, they are so nuanced. You really can take the, the concept of love and loyalty and begin to start subdividing. And as you subdivide, you get down to not only generalized statements, but statements that so relate to an individual, himself, herself, themselves, or whatever. And I think that it's very, very important, as David said, to keep an open mind, to keep dialogue going. And what I find very sad and frustrating is there are so many out there who are unwilling to take part in a civil discourse and to determine what is the right thing for the individual who is the individual in the center of everyone's personal struggle. So those are just a couple of my thoughts. All right, thank you. Um, Rabbi, would you like to uh, lead our um, separating into uh, small groups? Absolutely, yeah. Just thank you. I will do it. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, um, I, I want to thank each of our teachers this evening for giving us stuff to think about. Yeah. 
Um, and I'm gonna, I just wanna make sure that I have everybody in a breakout room before I start them. Uh, what we thought we would do, as long as our two communities are together this evening, uh, sharing as one community at this beginning of Shavuot, give us, I don't know, eight minutes, 10 minutes to just talk with each other and um, you can either reflect on the conversation we've begun together as a, as a whole group here, or you can think about uh, this question that I'm gonna, I'm gonna toss out, um, a much more generic Shavuot question, which is on this holiday where we celebrate receiving the Torah, not God giving it, but us receiving it, right? That we receive that Torah each year on Shavuot. Um, the question is this, what, yeah, what, what is the Torah that you receive on Shavuot? And what's the Torah that you feel so strongly about teaching others, um, both on this holiday and every day? Um, you know what, I'll show on you there. Um, yeah, every, each one of us has, has something that we love to communicate and teach. Um, and I would love for us to be able to share that in our small groups. So I am going to put us into a few breakout rooms. I'll give us, uh, I'll give us eight minutes to do that. So let's make sure that everyone has a chance to speak. And, um, and then we'll join back together um, to be able to conclude our time together. While you're doing that, I yeah. promised uh, that I was at Mount Sinai as a teenager. And there I am. Okay, uh, that's enough. <laughs> Fabulous. All right, here we go, everyone. See you in eight minutes. Are we? <laughs> Are um, we going anywhere? We. You should have the ability to join a room. Um, I'm gonna, let's see, David is in room two and so is Jerry. So why don't I go to room one and you go to room three? Okay, so how do I do that? Uh, do you see where breakout rooms are? Yeah, I, I'm just, this is one thing I've never been good at. On your, on your Zoom menu, you should have like a three dots or more. Right, okay, breakout break rooms. rooms. Okay, so I yeah, think I'll, I think I'll end the recording because it's- Okay. It's just one room.